presence of God shows up. Because how many know the pre- hold on? How many know the presence of God is smart, and He goes where He's welcome? All right, come on, somebody. But when you praise Him out of a pure heart, that's when you know the Holy Spirit's going to show up. How many can say Amen? So come on, let's give God a good praise for being here right now. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, tonight I, I have a word in my heart I want to share with you. And hopefully you brought your Bible today. I want you to get a hold of that Bible and, and uh, just kind of turn to 1 Corinthians. And as you turn there, I want to just tell you, I'm, I'm just so grateful to be here tonight. I've been doing the work of the ministry. Some people will say, Pastor, where have you been? I've been doing the work of the ministry. I say, Pastor, where have you been? I've been fulfilling God's calling on my life. Pastor, where have you been? I've been obedient to the Holy Spirit. He says, go, I go. He says, stay, I say, stay. How many want to walk with God? And... And I'm saying, God, the more I walk with you, the more I want you to bless my obedience. And uh, we've been in a lot of the churches. We were in Fremont this weekend. And it's amazing to see how many of the churches and the pastors and the leaders are just hungry for more of God. Do you, do you come to church hungry? Do you come to church and, and you feel like I got to get to church because this is the place that I grow? This is the place that I'm fed the word of God. Who feels like that? I think every person should be in a church where they're growing and being fed and and can grow and go to another level. How many agree with that? You know, I don't believe we're called to come and spectate in church or, you know, uh, just come for the worship alone or come for the word alone. How many know God's got a plan through all of it? Amen. And, uh, you know, we've been preaching and ministering and there's such a hunger out there. If it were up to the hunger of the churches and the pastors, I would be booked every weekend. I received three bookings just being in Northern Cal this weekend and I had to say no to all three because I recognize that we also have a responsibility here, here in San Diego. And how many know we're building a great house for the Lord here in San Diego? Amen. And um, I thank God for not only those that are part of the church, but I thank God for the pillars of the church. Because how many know in order to have a great house, you've got to have great pillars? Look at your neighbor and ask them, are you a pillar? Without pillars, we can't have a church. That's old school talk right there. That's old school talk there. That's old school talk. We're going to be getting into that a little bit. But I'm excited to be home. I'm excited that we're doing pretty good on Run for Hope. Notice I said pretty good. Um, we got a week to go and we got a lot of work to do, so don't give up on that. Amen. Tell your neighbor, don't give up on that. And let's finish stronger than we began. But I'm also excited of, of what's coming up. Um, I, we, we got visited by the San Diego PD today. They came by the office. And uh, we're excited that on November 10th, Uh, We're going to be partnering with the mayor and the mayor's wife and a number of city officials and and the entire city, really. And they're going to be doing an outreach November 10th right here in front of Victor Outreach San Diego. Amen. And we're going to be right a part of it. We're going to be hosting that. Keep that in prayer. Also, I'm excited that on September 30th, we're going to be praying the harvest back in. You know, sometimes fish fish get in the net and then they wiggle out of the net who knows at least one or two people this summer that wiggled out of the net okay so invite them back september 30th we're going to be having our good friend evangelist roy de la garza is going to be here it's going to be powerful and i'm believing that even greater miracles are going to take place we received reports of healing the last time he was here and uh, i had a number of people say i was healed i was healed by the power of God when Roy came. And so we're believing that on the 30th, we're going to have more healings. How many know someone that needs a healing? You know, not only a physical healing, but some people need spiritual healing. Amen? Some people need spiritual healing because they've been having a lot of sexual healing. Matthew's quick. You're quick. First Corinthians chapter three. I 
want to just share a few things that are on my heart tonight. Is that all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. When you have it, say amen. It reads like this. It says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. How many know God wants to increase our life? Now he who plants and he who waters are one. They're working together. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So if you're planting and watering, keep on doing it. It says, for we are God's fellow workers. We're in partnership with God. You are his field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed to how he builds on it. Let each one take heed to how he builds on it. Let each one take heed to how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble, watch this, each one's work or how each person has been building will become clear or be revealed for the day will declare it because it will be revealed, watch this, by what? By fire. Wow. And the fire, say the fire, will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on, it endures, how many of you want to endure? He will receive a reward. But if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. He'll either receive a reward or he will suffer loss. Tonight, I want to just talk to you on a quick subject entitled Forged in the Fire. Forged in the Fire. Before you're seated, ask your neighbor, how are you building? You may be seated. Thank you, Matthew. That was a wonderful melody. I want, to, I want to talk to you about a few things that God has placed on my heart. Is that all right? I want you to, he who has an ear, to hear tonight. I've been thinking about how I grew up in the Lord. I've said it before that Jesus saved me, but Victory Outreach truly raised me. Who has that testimony? And I've been thinking about growing up and thinking about way back when, and thinking about the church and, and what church was like back in those days. I got saved in 93. And one thing I begin to realize is church has really changed a lot. Some of you have been serving the Lord a while now. We've got a few of you still left. You know that church has changed a lot. People back in those days acted a certain way. Uh, let me put it this way, behaved a certain way. People talk to each other a certain way. And I'm not just talking about lingo that you hear uh, in, in the world. I'm talking about the way we spoke in church. We, we all kind of acted differently. We all kind of thought differently. And I think it was this. I think for us, it wasn't just about joining a church. That's what you see today. A lot of people just thinking about, man, I need, I need to find a church. I need to find a church. I need to join a church. I need to go, you know, and, and then, we, then they shop, right? They shop. They look for churches. You know, who has the best music, the best children's ministry, you know, the, the best of this? Who's the best speaker? Has the pastor written a book or not? They look for those types of things because they just want to join a church. For us, it wasn't about joining a church. For us, it was more about, more about joining with the vision of the house. Joining with the vision of the house. For us, it was about getting connected to a group of powerful people. Getting connected to a group of powerful people. And not only a group of powerful people, but a group of powerful people who are actually going somewhere. See, what kept me in the ministry of Victory Outreach is that I recognized that the people of Victory Outreach had a special calling, a special anointing, 
and they had the power of the Holy Spirit in their midst, who had the same testimony. See, some, today, things are not the same when you think about church. Today in church, we don't really do everything the way we used to. Now, for some of those things, I thank God there are certain things that have changed. I'm grateful that certain things have changed. Because back in the day, we used to have overhead projectors. <laughs> See, some of you still remember. And you had the overhead projector and then the clear words. Come on, somebody. Okay, thank God that's done, right, Jose? Thank God we don't do that anymore. We got LED screen. So there's a few things that I'm glad are gone. Like, you know, you used to have to wear, almost wear a whole suit on a midweek service. Come on, who remembers wearing slacks on a Friday night? Like, man, I don't want to wear slacks tonight. Come on, somebody. So I'm glad that some things have changed. But when you think about where the church is today, I think there's some things that shouldn't change. I, I think there's some things that we've, we've got to get back to. How many could say amen? I, I still believe that the old school is the best school. Now, some of you might not like it, you know, and I know we've got young people here. Oh, I don't want to hear this. I don't like it. But I want to talk to you about things that are going to keep you in your walk with God. Oh, I want to talk to you about some important things that I think that we ought, to, we ought to not let die, not let go away, not let become obsolete. Somebody say amen. amen. I think there's some things we ought to continue. I, I think there's some things that we ought to keep in the church. I think there's certain beliefs that we ought to keep in the church. Let me also say this. I, I think there's all, some certain euphemisms that we should keep in the church. Euphemisms or, 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 or what's a euphemism? A euphemism is another word for a saying or a way to say something. There's certain way, things that we should keep in the church. Back in the old school days, back in the days when I got saved was serving God, we used, to, we used to call our church family brothers and sisters. Because we recognized we were a family. How many can say Amen. We, when, I got, when I became a part of Victor Arch, it wasn't to be a part of a church. It was to be, be, be a part of a, a family, to be a part of a group of people who were brothers and sisters in Christ until they got married. Hey, come on, somebody. <laughs> also, I, I think back in the days, we used to pray about stuff. We didn't just say we were praying. When someone needed prayer, we actually prayed. When someone texts us, we didn't have text back then. We had beepers. Hey, but when someone called you. And said, I need prayer. We dropped what we were doing. We begin to take a moment to pray. How many think the church ought to pray for one another? That if you're a part of a church, you're not just a part of a church of people that you don't know a cold environment. You're a part of a family. And when your brother's down, you go down and you help him up again. Somebody say amen. We were brothers and sisters. We prayed. We also looked at our pastors and our leaders with respect. We didn't call them by their name alone. I know a lot of churches say, hey, Al, hey, Joe, hey, Manny, hey, uh, you know, Jose, how you doing? No, we, didn't, we weren't raised like that. We were raised to respect our leaders. Can I get some old school people to back me up? We refer to them as pastors. Hey, pastor. Hey, pastor. And not only did we, it wasn't just the title. We believed that they were God's servants. We believed that when they spoke into our life, they were speaking to our life the words of God. Nowadays, you got Christians running around and they, and they want to toy around with the pastors and bring them down to the level. That's not the way we were raised. We were raised right in the house of God. Mm -hmm. See, some of you won't, won't clap on it because you haven't been raised yet. But here at Victory Outreach, we respect our pastors. We respect the ministers. When they talk, it's like they're talking from the senior pastor. Somebody say amen. We took it serious. We didn't question their judgment. We didn't question, question what they were sharing with us as long as it was rooted in the word of God. Somebody say amen. amen. And then when something good happened to us, because how many know we serve a good God? I, I think we need to know that we serve a good God. When something good happened to us, we didn't walk around with a deserving spirit. We didn't say, oh, God, it's about time you blessed me. Oh, God, it's about time you came through. Oh, God, it's about time you healed me. Oh, God, no, we didn't walk out. We walked with a grateful heart. And I got a question. Are there any people here today that still have a gratefulness in your heart for a God that has been good to you? Is there anyone here that can still just give God praise and say, listen, my, my blessing may not be here, but I'm grateful for what he's done. I'm glad to be alive today. I'm glad to be in my right mind today. Come on. I'm glad that he woke me up this morning. I, I, he put a breath in my lungs. I've got a reason to praise him. I've got a reason to shout. That's the kind of church we need. That's the kind of church we were. That's the kind of church we are because we're a church that's taught well. Look at Jabra and say we're taught well. 
So I shared all that with you to share this because how many know we were also taught how to act in difficult times? See, when you, when you raise a child right in the house of God, you don't teach them how just to act good when things are going well. You teach them how to act right when things aren't going the way they planned it. And in those difficult times, we were taught this. We were taught difficult times will come. Hardship will come. We didn't present a gospel that was a bed of roses. We, we said there's going to be some thorns on those roses. We were taught when, when tough times come to take a certain posture in tough times. We were taught that when tough times come, you don't pull away from the house of God. You press into the house of God. Hey, come on, back me up, old school. Back me up, old school. We, we weren't taught to pull away. We weren't taught that when tough times come that you talk bad about the church, bad about the leadership, criticize the house of God. We were taught in tough times, you begin to lift up the name of Jesus. You begin to plug in. You begin to stay faithful. You don't run to the bar. You run to the altar. You don't run to TJ. You run to the altar. Oh, come on. You don't want to say nothing to me. You can go to TJ if you're ministering. We were raised right. Tell your neighbor, we were raised right. See, we planted ourselves. We were taught to plant yourself until your season shifts. <laughs> My goodness. If you're going to tweet anything, tweet that. If you're going to Facebook anything, plant yourself until your season shifts. Because I came to tell you on a Wednesday night, tough times don't last, but tough people do. And I came to tell you, if you plant yourself, your season will eventually shift and God will eventually bless you for your obedience. See, we also had a saying. Nowadays, people use a variation of this saying. They use a variation of the saying. Now, we had a saying when tough times came. But this generation, I notice, likes to leave words out of sayings. You know, we say get lit. Now they just say lit. But let me, let me tell you the difference. This generation use a variation of this saying when they say, I'm struggling, or they say this, they say, I'm going through it. I'm going through it. So here's my question. What in the world are you going through? Because you have not been clear. I'm going through it. Pray for me. Going through what? How do I know how to pray if I don't know what you're going through? I'm going through it. What in the world is it? See, let me break it down for you. Can I break it down for you? We never said I'm going through it. We finished the sentence. We said, I'm going through the fire. I'm going through. See, somebody said, why? I never heard that before. <laughs> exactly. Because you've taken words out of it. And when you take words out of it, you take the theology out of it. We didn't say, I'm going through it. We said, I'm going through the fire. See, oh, that's what it is. Yes. The fire. I'm going through through the fire. Now, this is important because this statement carries a profound theological truth in it. And most of the things we said in that time carried theological truth. In fact, the songs we sang, they're not like the songs you sing today or the songs you hear on the radio or you hear on YouTube and the songs you play when you pray. Those songs are good, but they don't have any theological truth to it. The songs we sang had theological truth to it. The message we heard had theological truth to it. The statements we made had theological truth in it because we recognize wherever there's theological truth, there's purpose. Oh, some of you are not going to catch that until you get home. We recognize that when we said we're going through the fire, how many of you have ever been through the fire? Some of you could be going through the fire right now. But we recognize that when we said we're going through the fire was rooted in the very scripture I read to you to open up this message. Oh, my God. 
I'm going through the fire, meaning this, I'm being tested right now. I'm being tested. What I have built for the last year is being tested. What I had built for the last six months is being tested. What I built when I graduated the home is being tested. What, what I built when I chose that person as a spouse is being tested. I am being tested right now. I'm not going through it. It's not some broad thing I'm going through. God has a specific purpose on why I'm in the situation I am in right now because the reality is that God wants to know if I'm ready for promotion or not oh come on somebody needs to get a hold of this word you're not going through it my friend you are going through the fire look at your neighbor and tell him you are going through the fire what am I saying to you tonight is I came to tell you you're going through the fire because you're being tested. God wants to know if you're building with the right material. God wants to know if you're truly serving him. God wants to know if you're a real worshiper. God wants to know if you're the real thing tonight. You're going through the fire because the Holy Spirit wants to know if he can use you in the future or you're going to drop out. I came to tell you something tonight. It's okay to go through it. It's okay to be tested. It's okay to have tough seasons. It's okay for things not to go your way. You spoiled brat. I came to give you two tonight. See, my question, and the reason I'm bringing this message out is because my question is, is this generation getting stronger or getting weaker? I'm asking myself this question. Do we have real missiles in the house of God or do we have a bunch of piccolo peats? Do you know what a piccolo peat is? It's that $2 firework you buy on 4th of July and it goes, and then it dies. Then it dies. I, I see people like that in the house of God all the time. You see for six months, see for a year, see even for three years. And then all of a sudden something happens because the test becomes the come. But God doesn't want you to be a piccolo P. He's called you. He's chosen you. And he's trying to raise up a weapon for his glory. Ooh, you said, that's not what I want to hear tonight. I know that's what you need to hear. Are you getting stronger, getting weaker? It seems like this generation wants the promotion without the process. It seems like this generation is doing all, it's, all it can to omit words filled with theological truth from the word of God. They want to take words out of the sentence. They want to omit. What is omit? It means to take out. It means to leave out. Let me tell you something, my friend. When God develops you, he leaves nothing out. Because God's not trying to do half a job on you. He wants to do the whole miracle. He wants to do the whole miracle. And Satan and his craftiness, because how many know the devil is smarter than most Christians? We call him a punk, but he's really not a punk. He's pretty smart. He's been doing this a mighty, mighty long time. He has actually deceived the generation into omitting many things from their Christian walk. Even the term Christian is in debate today. You could say you're a Christian, but that doesn't mean much when you measure it to the Christians of the book of Acts. I think there's some things that we ought to bring back. I think there's some words that we can't leave out. I think there's some things that we've got we've to be conscious about keeping in the house of God. Who's with me so far tonight? What about holiness? That's a word you don't hear in the church anymore. Holiness. Holy. Everybody try saying this. Say it. Holiness. All right. Good. Okay. What about holiness? What is holiness? Holiness is living a life that is separated from the world and is pleasing to God. Holiness is living and making your decisions with God in mind. We got so many people that are so worried about what other people say and care less about what God says. And what God is looking for is for a church that will bring holiness back into the picture. What about integrity? You know what you see nowadays is you see reputation and uh, 
personality reigning supreme in the church. People getting elevated for their personality, elevated for their, uh, for, for their reputation, elevated for their looks. You know? Give them an opportunity because they have looks. Many of our young people, and that's why I'm glad the young people are here tonight, even if some of them aren't paying attention. They're enamored by personality. They're enamored by gifts and talents. I saw one young leader wrote a book on marriage. They've been married six months. Are you kidding me? Are you absolutely kidding me? You wrote a book on marriage. You've been married six months. See how funny that is? Like, are you joking? But they got a great personality. So they even have a great testimony of what God pulled them out of. My friend, I, I came to tell you something. If you're riding on personality and riding on your gift and you haven't been tested by fire, you're going to have a short ministry. Jesus said it. He said it to his disciples. He said, look at these religious leaders. It's like the blind leading the blind. So what is a reputation? A reputation is what you are in front of everybody else. But you know what integrity is? It's what you are when nobody's looking. Come on, somebody. It's what you are when no one's around. It's what you are. It's when you're tested and no one's around. In front of everybody, you look like you got it all together. But when you're in the secret place and you're all by yourself, you ain't praying. You're playing. What about loyalty? I'm just throwing out words. I'm just throwing out words. Say it. Say loyalty. You know what loyalty, disloyalty is? Disloyalty? It's unfaithfulness in necessary relationships. Disloyalty is unfaithfulness in necessary relationships. And I think everyone needs to understand that you're not going to get to the place God called you to be without relationships. The right relationships that will help you get to the place that God has called you. Disloyalty is is unfaithfulness in a spouse that God gave you. Unfaithfulness in a godly relationship. Unfaithfulness to your leaders. Unfaithfulness to the people that God has brought into your life to help you get to the place God has called you to be. Ooh, quiet. It's news for some people. They're like, I've never heard that. But I came to tell you, you need relationship. You need the people of God. You, you, you know what you need to learn? You need to learn something called loyalty. What about the final thing? Endurance. See, we can't keep these words out. We can't omit these words. How are you building? How are you building? I know many of you are taking evaluation, but what about the word endurance? Say, say endurance. Endurance through what? Through blessing? No. Endurance through suffering. Endurance through suffering. That's the challenge. That's the challenge. I, I, want, I want you to hear that. That's the challenge we have in the church today. We have a generation of people that want the plan, but they want to pull the suffering out. They want the plan. They want the crown, but they don't want the cross. They, they, they want the promotion, but they don't want to pay the price for the promotion. And I came to tell you that to be a Christian is to understand that suffering and hardship and endurance have been sown into the plan. You cannot pull the plan of suffering out. If Jesus had to suffer, he said no student is greater than his master. No student 
is greater than his master. If I suffered, you will have to suffer. But understand this. I will be with you every single step of the way. I will not let you fail. I will not let you down. I will not make you look bad. I got your back. I am with you. I've given you the Holy Spirit. I've given you the power to overcome. You don't have to submit to temptation. You don't have to submit to fear. You don't have to submit to the problems of your past. Don't you know you have a power that the world does not possess because I have given that power to you. And when I have given that power to you, I will never take that power away. But if you abandon the power, you're on your own. You can't pull suffering out. The reason we have weak Christians, the reason we have weak leaders, the reason we have weak ministers in the church sometimes is because they don't want to endure suffering. And Paul said, to be a soldier, you must endure suffering as a good soldier, not being obedient to the plan, but being obedient to the planner, being obedient to one who called you, being obedient to the one that saved you, being obedient to the one that purchased your life with his very own blood. Here's what I want to tell you on this Wednesday night. I'll get to the fire in a minute. But here's what I want to tell you on this Wednesday night. You can't have the vision unless you're willing to endure the nightmare. You say, wow. Let me give you an example. Abraham. Big vision. <laughs> Who remembers him? He said, I'm going to make your father many nations. Your descendants are going to be the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. It's going to go on for generations. And how many know God was faithful? But the very night, the very night that he received that vision from God, he went to sleep and he had a nightmare. You know the story. And the nightmare was about all the hardship that his people were going to have to endure to get to the fulfillment of the plan of God. Now, see, See, you'll lose a lot of people in a point like that. That's all. See, I didn't sign up for that. Yeah, but you signed up for, to put a needle in your arm. And to smoke a glass pipe until your teeth fell out. So you'd rather suffer under the devil's plan, but you won't suffer under God's plan? What about Joseph? God gave him a dream. And a coat of many colors. And right after he got the dream, his brothers threw him in a pit. What about David? David was anointed to be king of Israel at 17 years old. They poured the oil on him. They said, you're the next in line. He had to wait 13 years before he finally became king. What am I saying to you is that the bigger the plan, the bigger the process. The bigger the vision God gives you, the more you're going to have to endure on your way to the plan. But I've got some good news for you that if you stick with God and you walk with God and you walk in holiness and you walk in integrity, come on, somebody, and you walk in loyalty to God and loyalty to his people and loyalty to his plan and you're willing to endure, guess what? In due season, you shall reap the harvest if you don't lose heart. I want to tell you the marriage can get better. The kids can get saved. The healing can come. The miracle can can come, but you can't give up in the middle of the process. Let God do what he wants to do in your life. Let God keep working on you. Stay on the potter's wheel. Don't throw in the towel because you can't win if you constantly quit. God is raising up a church that understands what it is to endure and to fight the good fight of faith. Come on and shout to the Lord if you're catching this right now. You say, why am I going through the fire, Pastor? Because God is simply trying to grow you and develop you. God is simply trying to make you into everything you've been praying for him to make you into. He's simply trying to answer your prayer. He's simply trying to respond to every altar call you may. Oh, if you can use anything, Lord, use me. Everybody wants to be used until they're being used. If you can, oh, here I am, ready and willing. Well, here we go. Come on, somebody. Here we go. Here we go. How many say, God has called me. God has chosen me. God has saved me. God has done a miracle in my life. 
Come on for the ride. God's got a big plan. You can be a part of it. We're part of a vision. Oh, I'm preaching good tonight, aren't I? Come on and give Jesus a big, big praise. See, God will pull away those things you love that want to remove you from his will. God will pull away those things you love to do in the flesh that try to pull you away from his will. That's why the Bible teaches that many are called, but few are chosen. The invitation to salvation is broad and sweeping. Everyone's called to come, but the survival rate of true believers is narrow and small. The survival rate of true believers is narrow and small. You should see some of the pictures I have at my house. Some of the pictures I have, pictures of groups of people. I was looking at the pictures of the family life flow, all these people, and I started to go one by one. I said, this one's not here no more. This one backslid, this one left, this one's messed up, this one graduated, but they're not here no more because the invitation is broad, but the survival rate is small. Some of those people who graduated up here, they're in the gas lamp right now. They're in TJ right now. They're acting a fool right now. They're swimming in their old vomit. So why am I preaching this word to you? Because I recognize that if you're going to make it and you're going to survive, you're going to have to develop some endurance in your life. You're going to have to determine that you're going to be loyal to God's plan because God has been loyal to you. Oh, yeah, that's right, Pastor. They're not here no more because something must be wrong with the church. <laughs> See, there's a problem right there. You're so worried about what the condition of the church. You're not worried about the condition of your heart. You're sitting under the word. You're sitting under the vision. You're sitting under the teaching of God's word. You're sitting under leaders of integrity. You're sitting under leaders that have their marriage together. You're sitting under leaders that give God uh, their best and give God first in, in their life. And they're seeking God with all their heart. They're raising godly children. They're fighting the good fight of faith. And there's something wrong with the church? <laughs> I beg to differ. Because when you come back in five years, guess what? We'll still be here. And we'll still be fighting the good fight of faith. Come on and back up your pastor a little bit. I, I got to get that off my chest. Because you got some young people that think they're bigger than the vision. We ain't going nowhere. Somebody say amen. amen. See, God will use the fire to test you. And that's what the world needs today as I get ready to bring it in for closing. I didn't get to my points, but man, I got a lot out tonight. Who got it? Who really feels like this was a good word right here? Good. I see newcomers clapping. Good. See, the world needs leaders who've been tested and developed by the fire of God. Ask your neighbor, are you being tested? Not preachers and teachers with the gift to speak. Preachers and teachers with the gift of endurance. Not leaders and, 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 with passion and noise and good Instagram posts but leaders with a calling and a word from God who not just know when to talk, but know when to stay quiet. <laughs> and leaders that instead of getting negative will turn that into a praise unto the Lord. That when all hell is breaking loose in your life, you don't go on Facebook and start posting it. You don't call up sister so-and-so and say, girl, I, I got a good one for you. No, no, no. You, you shut your mouth. You come to church. You sit in the same chair you sit in every single week. Don't come dance at the altar. Don't put on a show. Stay in your seat. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice and say, Jesus, you get all the glory for my life because if it wasn't for you, I would not be here today. I would not be here today. Come on, give God a praise. I'm done. Woo! Come on, praise him like you got something tonight. Come on, who likes that old school preaching? Who likes that old school preaching? Who thinks that that's what victory outreach should be all about? Tell your neighbor, God's just testing you. Sound with me. Adversity. Fire. Fire, not feathers, fire. 
<laughs> Test us. Three things. Watch this. Number one, adversity tests your motives and your maturity. Do you want to know how you could tell someone's mature or not? By what they eat. I have kids, and they want to eat Chick-fil-A every day. I can't eat that. That's too much salt. Shoot. I got to go to sleep for two hours after I eat that, right? But if you take me to a nice steakhouse that costs a little bit more money, I'll get down. Because I don't eat like a kid no more. I eat like a, I eat like a grown man. Or if my wife's going to cook it up, I'll sit down and enjoy that. You can always tell someone's maturity by what they eat. If you wake up in the morning and the first thing you check is the Kardashians, you got a problem. Oh, you think it's not real? Well, the first thing is you're looking at makeup and all that. You got a real problem. Or the sports. Or whatever you're looking at. It's quiet in here, boy. Because what you take in is what you will become. You ought to get up in the morning and seek the face of God and open up this word. Get a good sermon on YouTube. Come on, somebody. There's a lot of them. Get, get one of my sermons. Yeah, yeah, I'm promoting myself. I'm your pastor. Get under your pastor's voice. Get under the victory outreach pre preachers, not just the popular preachers. Get under the victory outreach preachers. Get a hold of this vision, man. Get a hold of what God is doing in victory outreach all over the world. Stop flirting with other ministries. If you want to be Hillsong, go to Hillsong. If you want to be Elevation, go to Elevation. But if you want to be victory outreach, be victory outreach. If you want to be a part of the lion's breed, then be a lion. I was studying lions. I'm going now. Lions are crazy, especially the male lion. Because the male lion, above all things, is concerned about his bloodline. And that's why the mother will keep the cubs away from the male lion. Because if one of those cubs raises up to try to test his bloodline, he will kill his own cub. Because legacy is the most important thing to the male lion. You're messing with the male lion. And let me tell you why. Because we're trying to break generational curses in your life. We're trying to break the curse of drug addiction. We're trying to break the curse of divorce. We're trying to break the curse of poverty. Come on, somebody. I care about the bloodline of this church. Radical victory outreach preaching. That's right. Who has the vision of this ministry? So you got to watch what you eat. Tell your neighbor, watch what you eat. Also, adversity tests your materials. Simply put, adversity tests what you're made of. Look at your neighbor. Look at two people and say, what are you made of? Are you a man or a mouse? Say, man, I just got stripped. <laughs> the fire came through. Maybe you were building with the wrong material. But you can rebuild. You, you can rebuild tonight. You can determine that, you know what, I'm not going to play any games in the house of God. I'm going to rebuild. We will rebuild. And then what's the final thing? This is the key. Adversity, fire, someone say fire, tempers your strength. The word temper is a process used in developing steel. It improves the hardness or elastic, elastic. It improves the hardness or elasticity by being constantly reheated and cooled in a metal. When, when I was going through the stuff with Rizzy, and I, and I have to use it, that's my testimony. Is that all right? I'd come home from 18 hours, Eugenia stay in the hospital, drive all the way back home and be by myself in the house and I'd 
pray, I'd just be, man, really struggling, really suffering. I knew many of you were praying for me. And I have a bad habit of sleeping with the TV on. Who has that habit? I was born with it. I'm afraid of the dark, y'all. That's really what I'm saying. No, it's not that I'm afraid of the dark. I'm afraid of the silence. And so there was this show that got my attention called Forged by Fire. And it's about these group of men that, are, it's like a cooking show, but they make metal weapons, make swords. Who watches that? It's awesome. If you're a man, watch it tonight. And you know that they have a time limit, right, to make that weapon. And so those guys get a strategy right away. If you're going to grow, you need a strategy. And they get the steel. They pick the steel. They're making a, a sword. And, and then, they, okay, and they got to temper that steel the right way. They got to heat it the right way. They got to they gotta bang it the right way. Because if they don't do, the, do it the right way, someone say the right way, that thing's going to be tested at the end of the show by a weapons expert that's going to get that sword. And he's going to get a piece of, you know, you, you know, you guys know, like a shield of armor or something or a big old piece of meat. And he's going to use that weapon to try to slice it or break through it. And there have been many instances when they make that weapon, and they know it right away. The guys that make it are like, oh, man, I didn't do that right. Oh, man. I didn't give it enough time. I didn't heat it hot enough. I cooled it too much. That when he hits it, there's been instances where that weapon has actually broken, shattered. And like the Bible says, suffered loss. And I've made that mistake. I've made that mistake. Not only in my life, by trying to take on challenges I wasn't ready for. And not letting God heat me up enough and cool me enough. But I've also made that mistake in elevating leaders to a place where I thought they were ready, but they weren't ready. They didn't let God really heat them. Too much water, not enough fire. Didn't really let the process go full strength in their life. And you know what? I've suffered loss. I've lost people in the church, people that have left. I've lost pastors. I've lost people that say, I'm going to be with you. Okay, so they're not around no more because we didn't allow them to endure suffering for a little while. We just told them what they wanted to hear. And just stay faithful, brother. God's a blesser. God, well, God's going to put you through fire too, y'all. Because he's preparing a weapon for his glory. He's preparing a weapon. I know some of you here, you say, ah, oh, that message is not for me. But there's some of you right now that you're going through a stripping down process because you're realizing there's some things in my life that haven't been done correctly. And I came to tell you that it's not too late. Today, you can come and make a commitment to God that, God, I'm going to let you do what you want to do in my life so that I can be the weapon that you have called me to be. And when God makes you that weapon, you're going to see the shift. Not only in your life, you're going to see the shift in your family's life. It's just going to all... The generational curse is going to get fully destroyed. I, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I know I'm talking to somebody. And I want to open up this altar to anybody here that says, you know what? That message was for me. And I want to develop that endurance in my life. I want you to come on up to this altar right now.